Hey folks, let's spend some time with friends up north. Pat Kreitlow of Up North News is on Lake Wissota. Sarah Yacoub of the Monaco Brewing Company Super Pack is on the Mississippi River. And up on Lake Monaco is Kirk Bangstead of the Monaco Brewing Company. Wherever you are, welcome. You're up north. Won't you let me die? Hello and welcome to the Up North Podcast. I'm Kirk Bankstead along with Pat Kreiklow and Sarah Yacoub. And guys, while we tailor this show for our friends and neighbors up north, we want to welcome our brand new listeners in the Milwaukee area where we're now being heard on 540 AM and 101.1 FM. Yeah. It's nice to have you with us, guys. You've got a lot you're going to learn a lot about how our state's being run and how it affects your corner of Wisconsin as well as where we are, the Northwoods. And, and without a doubt, uh, you know, it, it's these are topics that are important all the way around. As somebody who has lived in Milwaukee, has lived in Rice Lake, has lived in Chippewa Falls, has family in the, the Green Bay area, everywhere we need to have this respect for one another and how things are done so that we can continue to be, you know, the, the state that we want to be and not what sadly we are becoming. Coming up this week uh, on the program, our special guest today is Ann Jacobs, the chair of the Wisconsin Elections Commission. So we are going to jump right into things before we have her on, Sarah. We are so happy to have Ann join us. She has not been shy about pointing out the foibles and fall failings, excuse me, of the phony election investigation being conducted by former right-wing state Supreme Court Justice Mike Gableman. And she's been a leading voice defending Wisconsin elections against other attacks on its integrity and stability. Okay, so before we have Ann join us in the next segment, we want to set things up uh, noting that America is marking the one-year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection. Now, this it's, it's treasonous attack on the United States uh, by a capital, uh, on the Capitol by a mob of Trump supporters, uh, traitors who wanted to overturn a fair and secure election. So this attack only lasted a couple hours. We all watched it on TV, but mm -hmm. it still uh, lingers with us today. Um, and we can never forget that in the immediate aftermath of the attack, after uh, our own congressman, Tom Tiffany, Scott Fitzgerald, and a, a number of others were, were faced rioters and where their lives were in danger, they went and voted uh, to reject the duly cast and confirmed votes of American voters. Now, if you don't follow the news closely, live for me, or if you don't have friends who don't follow the news closely, it's kind of understandable how some folks might not get the connection between the January 6th attack and the sham Gableman investigation. But make no mistake about it, this is only an extension of the January 6th attack on our democracy that continues to this day, and Wisconsin is on the front lines. Now, if you do follow the news closely, some of this is going to be old hat. Uh, in fact, Rachel Maddow on MSNBC did a great recap a couple of weeks ago on this, but it can't be repeated often enough because it's important for people to get that January 6th was not some kind of a one-off event. There were well-planned things that happened leading up to it and well-planned things that have happened since then right here in Wisconsin. In fact, over at my day job at Up North News, upnorthnewswi.com or search Up North News WI on social media, we recently published a list of 18 ways Wisconsin Republicans have actively worked to undermine elections in our state since a safe and secure contest was held in November of 2020. That list includes a very quiet meeting held on December 14th, 2020, the day that Wisconsin electors met at the state capitol and certified that Joe Biden had won the presidential election in our state. Well, minutes later, also inside the capitol, a fraudulent slate of electors met behind closed doors to cast pretend votes for Donald Trump saying he'd won Wisconsin, which he did not, as shown in many recounts, audits, and court cases. There is, Kirk and Sarah, you know, so much more we could say about what this has all led to, how it led up to the Gableman investigation. Uh, we're going to get right to that with Ann Jacobs, you know, coming up, uh, including the, the rogues gallery of characters that he's brought on board, uh, a, a budget that he has already exceeded, and deadlines that have already been exceeded as well. Uh, but to do all that, we've got to bring in our guests right after this commercial break, the head of the State Elections Commission, Ann Jacobs. You're up north. <laughs> Welcome back to the Up North podcast. I'm Sarah Yacoub, along with Kirk Bangstad and Pat Kreitlow. 
And we're getting set to welcome this week's very special guest, the chair of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, Ann Jacobs. Welcome. Uh, Ann, thanks for being here. We're actually going to use this first part to help people understand the State Elections Commission, how it came to be, what it's designed to do. Then we're going to get into recent events. So, Ann, at the risk of editorializing the intro, the Elections Commission was created by Republicans who abolished the nationally regarded Government Accountability Board when the GAB was investigating potentially illegal coordination between the Scott Walker campaign and two major business groups. Uh, and that had something to do with uh, then Justice Mike Gableman, who wrote the state Supreme Court decision that killed that John Doe investigation. So now we have the Wisconsin Elections Commission, Ann. So tell us about the makeup, how it is that the, the chair is selected, and maybe how your role differs from that of the administrator, Megan Wolf, whose name we hear about as well. So t t give us a little background on the commission. So the commission was formed in, to be created in 2016. Um, and in, it is made up of three Republican appointees and three Democratic appointees. There is an appointee from the leader, uh, majority leader, and minority leader of the Senate, majority leader, minority leader of the assembly. And then the um, leadership of each party submits three possible former clerks to sit on the commission. They are, those names are submitted to the governor and then the governor chooses one retired clerk from each party. So it is designed to be a 3-3 body. Um, any action of the commission requires four votes. And then you asked about the difference between the commission and the administrator. The commission itself is really there for policy decision making, um, writ large. We are a, you know, essentially a volunteer board. We get a very small stipend for each meeting, um, but we're not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the elections. We don't hire the people who work in the elections commission. We are not programming computers. We are not doing any of that. That real work of running elections falls to the administrator and to her staff. And under state law, uh, Administrator Wolf is the chief elections official of the, the state of Wisconsin. Gotcha. Okay. Great. So, uh, Anne, I wanted to go back. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, um, but uh, the reason uh, we're so happy to have you on the show is because just before the holidays, uh, you know, Rachel Maddow did this big, a huge show on MSNBC, and it talked about something that I was, I didn't even know about, which says to me that a lot of Wisconsinans didn't know about it because I follow politics quite closely, that like December 14th, there was a fraudulent state, a fraudulent, 10 fraudulent Republican electors, because they weren't, they were fraudulent, that submitted, uh, you know, the, these papers saying that Trump and Pence won Wisconsin. And they kind of like, it was fraudulent and phony. And so, I mean, I wanted to learn more about um, what ha like how did that happen and and did you guys know it was happening and you know what are the ramifications for that because Rachel Maddow you know probably in New in her booth in New York somewhere said why you know if we let this happen in Wisconsin look at all the other things that happen it's a cancer that 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 metastasizes because now we have a Gable investigation we have all these other crazy things happening so it seemingly started there and I wanted to kind of hear from from you know from you what was going through your mind and your committee's mind at that point so i have to be very judicious about that because there is um and i think it's public record that there was a complaint filed with the commission on that topic that's the gentleman who was on rachel maddow's show talking about that the commission still hasn't ruled on that so i think talking about that specific event would be improper and i'm not going to do it but let me sort of go to what you're talking about writ a little larger which is um, what happens if there isn't um, a recognition of reality, right? Like what happens if we simply decide that, you know, the majority vote doesn't matter or that we can simply fabricate a reason to reject um, the popular vote? Mm -hmm. and, and that is something where I, we're seeing, you know, that would have been a very fringy position 18 months ago and now it is literally in the mainstream where people are talking about how a legislature should be allowed simply based on a whim about what they pretend is fraud, be able to either undo an election or choose different uh, electors based on those beliefs 
uh, rather than reality. And that I think is really, it's pernicious, it's dangerous, it is a complete rejection of American values. And that is something that I really am very concerned about. I have a follow-up question. Um, and I, I, I totally understand how you might not be able to answer. Um, how does, uh, would the, I mean, given, I mean, uh, the Attorney General, Josh Call, would, would he be the only person, um, you know, that could bring charges against these electors that, that, that potentially committed criminal acts, or is that too close to the investigation as well for you to answer? Um, I don't know the answer to the question. It would be too close for me to get there, and I, I'm also really, really conscious of trying to maintain what my role is versus the idea of criminal charges and the like. There are already people jonesing to lock up election administration officials, and I, I think that um, makes me very uncomfortable in a lot of ways, so um, not the least of which yeah. my own. Yeah. I, I understand the sentiment, Anne, because uh, and I understand where we're you know where where Kirk uh, where his energy is coming from because we're watching you know Mike Abelman's investigation where he's trying to to prosecute mayors. We had the the mayor of Madison on a couple of weeks back, and you know we're we're joking, but we can't believe we're actually having to joke about the mayor of Madison going to jail. You know because that's what some po political you know opponents or or enemies want and and uh, just as 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 uh, easily as readily there's a new resolution in the legislature that calls on you and megan wolf and most of the other commissioners to resign or else be referred to district attorney's offices for you know some kind of of criminal charges when you were offered this opportunity to to serve on the state elections commission whenever that was Anne. I can't imagine you ever thought we'd we'd be having a conversation about trying to lock up mayors and elections commissioners over disputes over elections that aren't in dispute. In 2016, when the elections commission was created and we were all appointed at the same time, the very first thing we had to do was draw lots to find out which party was going to have the first chairmanship. Um, the chair sits for a period of two years and it rotates between the parties. So one of the parties had to start. Um, and I don't remember what we did. I think we drew, drew lots out of a badger mug um, <laughs> that somebody pulled out as the uh, official thing to draw lots out of. And um, so the Democrats were uh, given the opportunity to have the first chairmanship. And that was Mark Thompson, uh, who remains on the commission with me. So that's 2016. That is the election of Donald Trump. And um, we had a civilized, calm series of meetings. The election was had. We had a full recount statewide um, and the Democratic chair of the commission. And um, the Democratic chair of the commission then certified that President Trump won. And there were no complaints from any Republicans about that. And we moved forward because the legitimacy of the election process was so important. Um, and so it's sort of astonishing where we've come from there. I will agree with you. This was not what I expected. Certainly it was not even what I expected after serving the first couple of years. Sure. And Anne, the, the Gableman sideshow isn't the only review of the 2020 election that we're seeing, along with recounts and court cases. There was also the work done by the Legislative Audit Bureau. So until now, the LAB for our audience has had a spotless record of nonpartisan service, making sure government work is as clean and efficient as possible. But eyebrows were raised over the LAB review that was ordered by Republicans and the Elections Commission had to painstakingly review and address each one. Can you get into and talk about how that audit could have, should have been handled differently and whether Republicans are right or wrong? Uh, who claim the audit somehow proves there's reason to doubt the 2020 results. What insight can you can you give us on that? Okay, that's a lot. So let me <laughs> unpack that a little bit. First of all, um, what the LAB found were a series of, when they were accurate, they found a series of things that were suggested changes, um, most of which were fairly innocuous uh, and really didn't have much to do with vote counting, vote assessing, and the like. Um, what the LAB did, though, in their report um, was 
turned that nonpartisanship sort of upside down. And they made a lot of, uh, first of all, they made a lot of errors, which we spent a lot of time correcting. Um, they implied a lot of things as nefarious when they were not. Um, and the, the most charitable option we could give was that, you know, maybe they just didn't understand. But it really, there were so many of those opportunities to say it in a positive way that they said it in a negative way or implied things or put things in footnotes um, that it, it really was unfortunate. So the LAB's recommendations, the commission went through all of them. Some of them were silly. Um, so in the state statute, the statewide voter registration system is referred to as the statewide voter registration system. Now its previous incarnation was called that, the SVRS. When we upgraded that, we changed the name to WISVOTE because it's catchier. <laughs> um, and so one of the big important, you know, they talk about these 40 recommendations from the LAB was that we changed the rules or the or administrative rules to call it WISVOTE. Okay. Uh, okay. Make I mean, somebody look, feel better. Right. We'll I mean, it, even you even know. one of the Republican commissioners, Dean Knutson, referred to some of these recommendations as as somewhat petty. And and again, as a former legislator, that this was, I, I'm not going to lie, it was stunning to see this kind of work out of out of the LAB. And we're we're not, you know, there, there's no need to to cast aspersions. We're we're just reflecting on that this was. This was not what we typically expect in in a review of elections, but to to your well, they great lied. credit, yeah. like overtly, they said that I refused to speak with them, and I think I put it out on Twitter, my letter to them saying, "Hey," or email saying, "Hey, I understand you're going to be calling me. Are, are you still going to do that?" And they never did. Um, I also sent them a letter on a different topic. So yeah, um, it, it you know it's interesting, Pat, because a lot of legislators told me, well, you know, legislative audit bureau, completely nonpartisan, boy, they're really good guys. That was usually the phrase. And I got to tell you, whatever that reputation was, it's not deserved today. And that's unfortunate if they're expected to be a neutral arbiter. And I agree with you. I agreed with Dean that some of those recommendations were so ticky tacky. Um, <laughs> as, as it was just like to add numbers to them that we're going to, oh, we got to change the administrative code to call it WISVOTE, even though WISVOTE is the generic statewide voter registration system. Yeah. Well, look, in the uh, we've got about three minutes left here. So, Kirk, I think that's enough time to get in a question about nursing homes and the, you know, the, the recommendations that the, the commission made at the beginning of the pandemic. Kirk, what did you want to know about that? Yeah. So, I mean... The latest, the latest we're hearing is that you know the reason that we should put you in prison is because somehow you broke the law when you tried to make it easier to collect votes from nursing homes during COVID during a pandemic. Um, it, there are three Democratic appointed electors and three Republican appointed elect or commissioners, and five five of them voted to do this and one voted six against it. Six of them so, voted. Six of them. Six of them. Okay, voted all to six. Do it the first time and then. Five of them voted subsequently to continue it. So tell me, I mean, t t tell me why this is absurd to try to throw you, try to whole throw all you guys in jail, even the Republicans, when you're trying to make it easier to vote. Well, I let's back up to remembering the, the beginnings of the pandemic. We didn't know how COVID was spread, right? We're like washing our Amazon boxes because nobody knows <laughs> how COVID is spread. And the governor issued an edict and said only essential personnel are allowed in nursing homes. And there was a long list of who was essential personnel and it was not elections officials. So we <laughs> wrote a letter, a joint letter, Democrats and Republicans to the governor saying, could you please modify this to include elections officials? Gov governor said no, um, which wasn't surprising when you think about it because it would result in four complete strangers wandering in and out of people's rooms in nursing homes. But so in any event, so they're not allowed in. And because they're not allowed in as special voting deputies, how are we going to make sure these people get to vote? Their constitutional right to vote. How are we going to get there? So what the commission said was, well, we're assuming the nursing homes are going to follow the governor's edict and not let in random strangers, whether they're election officials or whoever. We're assuming they're going to follow the law. And therefore, what we're going to do is go to the second part of the law which says if the special voting deputies don't manage to see a particular resident, we mail them an absentee ballot. 
makes sense, right? Because you makes don't want sense. somebody's constitutional right to vote to be dependent on being in the facility those two days in a 30-day period that happen to be when the special voting deputies turn up. So that's what we did. And therefore, those people got to vote. And for all of the, the brouhaha about this, everybody, um, the importance of allowing people to vote is being sort of shoved to the side merely because they're in nursing homes. And people are in nursing homes for lots of reasons. They could be there for rehab. You know, they broke a hip. They got to be in for a few weeks. They could be, um, you know, have other physical disabilities that have nothing related to cognition. And they and then don't finally, surrender their rights. Exactly. They don't surrender Finally, their even rights. if they're really getting older and maybe they have a little dementia or something, until a judge says they don't have the right to vote, they have the right to vote. Exactly. And that's where the Racine County Sheriff bringing or recommending that there be charges because somebody got to vote. Uh, is, is what makes this even more stunning. Ann Jacobs is the chair of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, and we are going to continue our visit on the other side of this break. You're listening to the Up North podcast and radio show, and we'll be back in a bit. Won't you let me die? We're back to the Up North podcast, and we're here with Ann Jacobs, and we're get, she's doing it all for the glory of Gov, as the opposed glory to love. Of gov? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I didn't know that that's where this was going, but thank the you. The glory Kurt. of Gov, go, you, honest government. I had to figure something out with the Karate uh, Kid theme song. Pat. You did, you did. So, uh, Ann Jacobs, chair of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, is here. Uh, we've wanted to get into what uh, the legislative Republicans claim is an investigation being done by former state Supreme Court Justice Mike Gableman, but there, there are so many issues that surround this attack on elections, uh, and frankly, so much of what Gableman has done has been uh, uh, downright buffoonish that we haven't been able to get into the weeds on it. And in fact, before, you know, I'm, I'm going to go off on a tangent again, because again, we want to make sure our friends and neighbors up north understand we hear about uh, a lot of criticism about, you know, how votes are counted in Milwaukee and how votes are encouraged in, in Madison or Green Bay and, and, and such. But, you know, this is something that affects everybody when, when you attack election integrity and when you, try, when you make it tougher to vote rather than easier. The, the most glaring example, of course, is Congressman Tom Tiffany signing his name to a legal brief that supported a Texas lawsuit that sought to overturn the election results in Wisconsin. He wasn't signing that brief to overturn just Milwaukee's vote. It was the votes of everyone in northern Wisconsin and elsewhere who voted. So, and I wanted to ask you, sh should voters in rural areas and Republican dominated areas, should they care about all this talk about elections and, and voting, voter access and, and voting rights? What what does this mean to, to folks outside of some of the larger metro areas? I think it's really important for um, our friends in the more rural areas, whether they're Northwest, what have you, to be aware of what's going on in election administration, because especially in communities where maybe um, Democratic voters are in the minority and they want to make sure that their vote is counted. And there's a bunch of different uh, ways and issues that um, voters can be making sure that where they have some control and some ability to help that they do that one of which is volunteering to be poll workers. I know everyone jokes that it's the most boring job ever, but we need smart, thoughtful, honest people running elections. And even if all you're doing is checking people in at the table, it's a hugely important job that is required in order to make our elections run. Um, a lot of the laws and a lot of the propositions that are being uh, put forward aren't only about urban areas. Um, one of the examples is drop boxes, right? Um, so the cities were talking about having drop boxes. Um, I live in the city of Milwaukee. There were drop boxes at libraries. Very convenient. But we have 1,850 different municipalities, most of which are incredibly small voting groups. Those drop boxes are what make it convenient for the people in those communities to vote. 
right? I'm driving by on my way to the IGA to pick up some groceries and I can put my ballot in the drop box that's attached to city hall. I've made sure that my ballot's gonna get there. And that's true up North, particularly where the distances involved to be able to go vote can be really profound. So, I, I mean, I think we have to look at this as all of us in it together, not just, you know, a few folks in a city here and there. Well, and you bring up such a good point. I mean, with drop boxes, that's not a partisan issue. I mean, being no. able to help your elderly neighbor or to voting take- voting by mail, yeah. Right, I, and you know, this treating everyone like they're nefarious or doing something illegal as the starting point that we have to control for, as opposed to, you know, how we proceed through life is, you know, taking people at good faith until they give us reason to think otherwise. It just sounds wild, but if we can get into some of the more recent developments, uh, including a fishing expedition by assembly Republicans for hundreds of millions of data points about Wisconsin voters, what are they asking for ostensibly for what purpose? And why does this sound like a massive invasion of privacy by politicians? This is something the commission is going to review at its next meeting next Monday. So imagine that you can't get too far into it, but anything you can share to help us understand? Sure, but there are, is a ton of different information that's available that you can purchase through the state of Wisconsin on voters. So I could go in tomorrow and I could buy the list of every single person who voted in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it will cost $12,500. It doesn't cost that much for any reason other than the law literally says you must charge $12,500. That's the law. So it's not something that WEC made up. So you can go buy that data. You can go buy that data about a county, a municipality, one location, a particular election. If you want to find out who voted in the February primary in 2018, because that was a senatorial year, you can get that data. So, um, what the legislature is asking for, however, isn't that sort of data. They're asking for every point of data relating to a voter, name, address, date of birth, driver's license number, last four of social security, date of registration, date of registration change, who changed uh, I'm sorry, the date. I'm sorry, they're asking for social security and driver's license info? Uh, by definition, they are by virtue of what they asked for. Wow. Um, and that's prohibited by law to be disclosed. Like you can't give that personal identifying information. And there's also information relating to um, our enrollment in the national group called ERIC, which helps us make sure that we've got clean voting rolls. Uh, there are limitations on the data that we can give to other people on that. So um, the data they were asking for is so massive. Like you have to understand that the Elections Commission doesn't run on like home PCs <laughs> or a server in a closet somewhere. We have massive data servers as a part of the Department of uh, Enterprise Technology. And we require giant servers because we're dealing with millions and millions and millions of data points relating to um, our voters and all the work we do in elections. So they've asked for some really out there stuff and the commission is gonna be talking about it this week. Great. Where can, so uh where can people go to follow up on that conversation to learn more about what happens? Uh, Elections.wi.gov uh, will have our meetings and our next meeting that we're talking about this on is January 11th. Uh, fair warning, our meetings go rather long. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That meeting is also the day of the nominating papers challenges and that goes first uh, beginning, I think right now, as of right now, we're beginning at nine o'clock in the morning. I, so, and I um, you know, if you want to spend the day with us on Zoom by watching us, you can. And some of our reporters do. God bless them. Yeah. I, <laughs> and I assume, I assume these meetings are ex ex can be extremely boring, which is what we want out of a elections commission. <laughs> we don't want drama, and you you guys haven't given us any drama. The drama is being created from outside of of your committee, unfortunately. Um, I want to. Uh, switch to the Gableman investigation, was it, which is an extension of the January 6th insurrection. Uh, you know, uh, it's an extension of the big lie. Um, that's why we're doing the show today. It's January 5th. Tomorrow is the anniversary of January 6th. So, and there's a lot here. Uh, we've talked about the Gableman investigation, the sham investigation on our podcast every week uh, for a long time. But I have a, a question. What's more troubling about the Gableman investigation? the blatantly pro-Trump people he's hired, 
the secrecy about the contract, the cost that, that Wisconsin, ta Wisconsin taxpayers have to pay to foot the bill for this sham investigation, the length of time, which has just been extended from December 31st, or the way that he's bungled this with a lot of copying and pasting from other states without like asking about Dominion voting machines in places that don't have them. I mean, that's five questions of craziness, but I'm throwing them all at you right away. Um, that is five questions of craziness, and I'm going to answer with number six. And my answer is the secrecy. The legislature is required to conduct their business in public. Uh, Pat, you were there a long time. There are rules about meetings and what can be discussed and when it can be discussed and how it can be discussed. And instead, what the Gableman investigation is trying to do is create a secret star chamber where you go into a conference room in the office next to the liposuction clinic <laughs> and you give secret testimony and never to be seen or heard from again, but he can tell people whichever snippet he wants, but you're precluded from doing anything about it. That is a complete corruption of our government process. Things happen in public uh, with regards to the legislature whose power, whatever it is, comes from the legislature. And that means it should be in public and it's not. And all these other things are part and parcel of doing, I think, of really doing it sort of in this ham-fisted, halfway sort of way. But ultimately, the biggest risk is that issue of, of being in public. And the funny thing is, they could be doing all of this in public before the Assembly Elections Committee and the Senate Elections Committee, which is, you know, by, you know, the Gableman probe is by extension, you know, from them, but the committee itself could do it. The committees themselves, the elections committees, what they've done in public are basically dog and pony shows where they have brought in almost everybody but the experts, everybody but Megan Wolf and, and commission members and staff uh, to, to play up conspiracies, uh, to bark at the moon, um, you know, and you, you've no doubt watched what the, what the legislators are, are saying and doing in public, I have to think you feel it could, they could be doing things a little differently if they really wanted to uh, cast light on what the 2020 election really was like. Uh, it seems to me that if they really wanted the information they're seeking, they could simply agree to hold these depositions in front of the assembly in public, and they'd have people ready to testify. Well, not necessarily. We'd have to agree on scope. Um, you can't just walk into a deposition and be like, I'd like you to tell me everything about everything. Um, it's not how civil litigation works. Um, but I think you'd have a much better chance of getting people in to actually give the testimony. If it's so important, let's do it publicly and let's let people see it. Um, and, and the conspiracy theories have been just extraordinary. Um, I was very entertained by the gentleman who um, appeared on that Zoom screen with all those old monitors behind him. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> and, and I was just like, you know, I'm a, a kid who grew up in the uh, 80s and 90s. And I was like, War Games was a long time ago. Mm. So I'm dating myself, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I want to, I actually want to draw Sarah into this, you know, with, with her legal experience as well. Because again, th this investigation, you know, and, and where the testimony is and where the depositions can be taken. Um, and, and Sarah, you've done a lot of legal work in, in California. We like to think that things are a little, you know, uh, different out there. But I can't imagine that this would be, that these levels of, of, of secrecy would be tolerated. And I'm, I'm wondering, what else are you curious about from Anne in terms of how Gableman and these other, you know, uh, uh, people that sometimes we didn't know their names for the longest time are going about trying to gather information. Well, so looking at this as a former criminal prosecutor, you know, if we were afraid of the truth, then we were doing something wrong. And why are we doing things in secret if we're not afraid of the truth? So sort of the mental gymnastics later, it, it just, it doesn't make much sense. Um, and, but when you're so far down the rabbit hole of Twilight Zone, the challenge then becomes how do you talk about it in a way that resonates? I was listening to a podcast that political division right now has become part of our identity. So when you try to confront someone on the big lie, they feel it as a personal attack. So experts like Ms. Jacobs and other people who are living this, you know, how do you talk about these things in a way 
that you can reach people on a rational level, given that we're so far down this rabbit hole of insanity. No pressure. I, I, I mean, I think that's really important. And I think it, it, one thing I will tell you about the Elections Commission, for all of this craziness that we see going on around it, we have been surprisingly consistent and uh, unanimous in the generalized administration of elections. We have agreed on so many things, the things that make elections work. And um, I, I really think that if we're going to talk about division, we also have to embrace when it's working. And the Elections Commission, we had a successful 2020 election. Um, and we need to be proud of that. And people didn't get sick. Um, and so, you know, we need to take that same energy and put it towards 2022. I don't want people on the left to be despondent about elections either. Despondent people don't vote. I want you to go vote because I want you to know that your vote is going to be safe. It's going to be counted accurately. Mm -hmm. And and we want you to get out there and vote. Yeah. So from what I just heard, Anne, it seems like the Republicans and Democrats can work together. They just work together well at the Wisconsin Elections Committee, and they don't necessarily work well together, you know, outside of the Wisconsin Elections Committee. Is is that a is that a well, rational uh, statement? I'll, actually, I'll, I'll I'll make the question a little tougher in, in saying that from covering some of the early 2020 meetings, no, you don't always get along in these meetings. There have been more than a few three to three votes, and but what's the difference between I, you kind of mentioned already, but the difference between when there are these three three divisions. And you know you you get frustrated with each other versus the times when you've said oh no 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 we're we're in agreement on this where 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 how do you describe the line between those two uh, outcomes? I, I think it's really just ordinary elections administration versus political hot topics. Mm -hmm. And I mean maybe that's too blithe and a little too cute, but you know how are we going to make sure that clerks get updated email addresses in order to ensure cybersecurity? that is not a sexy topic um, we're bringing it up on january 11th uh, the proposal is to extend our grant so more clerks get a uh, wi.gov email address for security purposes i don't think you're going to see fireworks on that it's not exciting but you know what it's important and that's and that's what we want to end on is the fact that, like Kirk had said before, this is the stuff that should be boring. The act of voting should not be controversial. Uh, it's it's what you do in policy afterwards. But if, if we're fighting over who gets to vote, then we have some serious issues that we're talking about on this January 6th anniversary and Jacobs, which is why we are so honored that you joined us. And thank you again for for being part of our discussion this week. So delighted to be able to join you all. I really had a good time. Great. Glad to hear. We will be back to wrap up the show in a moment. You're up north. Can, can I can I just say that Kirk, you know, in the early days of this show was a little hesitant to select music and boy, talk about, I mean, we've created a monster here. So so the West Wing hey. thing. The West Wing theme song. I mean, we just right. talked to Ann Jacobs. We needed heroic music. We need to like feel like we solved something tonight, and we got we it with the West Wing theme song. Yep. We we need we you know, America for Bartlett. Hey, before we go, we want to thank our hosts at News Talk ninety two seven, home of the Devil Radio app, where you can listen to the show on demand. On weekends, you can catch us on our website upnorthpodcast.com and all of the usual places where you can subscribe to podcasts. You can watch us on YouTube by searching up north podcast if you really want to see our mugs while we're doing this show uh, the video version is also put on the facebook page of kirk's monaqua brewing company uh, and you can reach us by email by writing to info at upnorthpodcast.com and you can find the work that i do on a daily basis over at upnorthnewswi.com don't forget the wi or search up north news wi on facebook instagram or twitter kirk all right so this last segment um, you know, this show has been all about uh, thinking back to last January 6th and uh, um, and, you know, that that actual moment where you were like, what is happening to America and never forgetting that you know, we almost lost America that day. And so I wanted to kind of end with having you guys tell your stories of where you were 
um, when you when you watch this on the, on TV. So I'll start. Uh, I was, you know, I spend. I often go to Costa Rica on a, on my on my holiday break, and I, I I go surfing. And so I was in a place called Nosara, Costa Rica, and there was like a hotel bar, and I was there with my girlfriend. And all of a sudden, we started getting texts from all of our friends saying, "You gotta you gotta start checking this out." Or I saw this Facebook feed just change from normal to crazy. So we asked them to turn CNN on, and we were the, like the only Americans in this hotel bar, and everybody else was just going about their business, and we were literally crying, um, both of us, because we were worried that we might not come back to the same America that we had left uh, a couple weeks prior. So uh, it, it is a moment that will always be implanted in my head, and, and this is why this podcast exists today, is because I felt I needed to do something uh, to help change Wisconsin after that. Yeah, I was home uh, with my then two and four year old uh, watching the speeches and it was like watching a slow simmer frog boil to death. And just as things escalated, it started with the rhetoric and then as people converged on the Capitol and I cried. And, you know, as a former prosecutor, I don't cry. There's no crying in baseball and I, I kind of uh, keep it together. But it was so devastating to watch. And the hardest part was having my two-year-old give me a hug and my four-year-old asked me what was going on. And I didn't have words to explain what we were watching. And I was stuck between, do I let the TV play? Do I turn it off? Is this going to get worse? And having my kids be there, um, it, it was it was really devastating and jarring. I can only imagine uh, having kids there as well, obviously being a, a, an empty nester. Um, and for me, it was uh, it, it was somewhat similar to 9-11 in that, uh, you know, again, it took place, you know, in the morning hours this time, late morning to midday. Uh, but again, I couldn't move. Uh, I'm just watching the TV at home and saying, this is looking troubling. You know, this is looking, tr this is looking more troubling. And rarely can you use Facebook as like a real time, you know, uh, news sharing service. But I, I put up a status about, I don't know if you all know this, but, you know, th there's people in the Capitol and, and it's not looking good. There, and, and on and on it went. And, you know, so that was, it was somewhat um, paralyzing to me uh, to, to be watching this. But, you know, again, trying to take it all in because we're going to have to, you know, spit it back out and convey it to people. Well, I really highly recommend, I don't know the name of the author, but I, I highly recommend what was put up on the Daily Beast today by their senior politics reporter, because his feelings were the same as mine in that, never mind your feelings of what was going on that midday. It's the feelings of what went on later that night and since then that have motivated us. That after that, after people died, after police were violently assaulted, people, elected officials, still voted to overturn the will of the voters in America. That is the most troubling thing. It's what led to this program and to so many more initiatives to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again, because trust us, it will if we allow it to. So let's not. So with that, it's time for us to go. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks to our guest, Ann Jacobs, chair of the State Elections Commission. And thank you for joining us at the cabin. Come on back up north next week. Thank you.